we might have to start that one again. Do you want to start us again? Yeah, I'll start us off again. Oh, I did so well. Oh, well. Actually, I think it was quite lucky that they didn't. <laughs> no, <Nah, laughs> it was good. <laughs> <laughs> That was, right. a, that was a good start. It thanks, was a good start. Thanks for hanging in there, guys. <laughs> All right. Uh, g'day, everyone, and welcome to the Battleforge Gaming Podcast. This is episode two. I'm Background Mike, and as always, I'm joined by BFG Justin. How we doing, guys? And today, we've got our special guest, Mark, the Dice Daddy Seeker. G'day, Mark. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank no you. Worries, man. So, yeah, we'll go over quickly what we just... Let's Went over f- without audio. Let's let's not forget our other special guest, little Zeta here. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. So got- ha- housemates, little doggo. They're they're out busy right now, so she's going to uh, accompany us on today's podcast. Probably won't get too much audio from her, but if you are watching this on YouTube, then you'll definitely be able to see the cuteness. So, and she might be joining you regularly for a Saturday afternoon podcast. Well, we'll just we'll see how we go. We'll see how <laughs> we'll see how popular she'll probably be the most popular member of the podcast. Oh, easily, <laughs> easily. So, uh, yeah, how's everyone going? Justin, you've had a busy morning? Yeah, very busy morning. So I headed down to General Games Churnside Park and picked up my pre-orders, Space Marines. Got a bunch of new boxes to sort of add reinforcements to my Blood Angels because I needed more boxes of Blood Angels. <laughs> but the thing I was excited about was the, the new codex. I wanted to flick through that and see the new detachment rules for myself. There's some pretty cool detachments in there. And I set up, I was trying to set up my Warhammer app. I was having, I've currently had a few issues with Warhammer Plus and the Apple app, which seems to be a reoccurring sort of issue, but I'll get it sorted and I'll be able to make as many lists as I want and read all the detachment rules and enhancements. The cool thing is my list, the one I'm getting ready for ARC, which we'll touch on a bit later, has reduced by a further 40 points. So, I'll be able to squeeze some extra stuff in there. So that's that's cost reductions based on the new codex, is it? Correct. Yeah. Yep. And that's just Space Marine stuff because I do have a cheeky little assassin in there, but I'm not sure what came down in points yet. I think it might have been some intercessors, but we'll flick through them. We'll find out. That that's sort of my my Saturday. Apart from that, you know, we work together. It's just been work and and the and the streams as per usual. Yeah, and obviously we've got Mark today, so it's been a little while since we've mm-hmm. since we've caught up. Mark, you going all right? Yeah, mate, been good. Last time we caught up was when we uh, uh what was it? Celebrated Judge Milestone for when he hit the five k. That's right, followers. Five yeah. k on yeah, on TikTok. On TikTok so Still have to good. do a ten k one, but we're actually closer to like twelve now. So hey, that's good. That's yeah. good to hear. So yeah. yeah, yeah, awesome. So yeah, as as we sort of went over earlier when we had no audio. <laughs> Uh, we last episode we did uh, an, a brief sort of history on how Justin and myself got into the podcast. Yeah. So we thought it'd be cool if you, Mark, would like to take us through how you got into the, the hobby. hobby. Yep. 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 Uh, absolutely. So it didn't really get me into it, but the first time I experienced the hobby was one of my uncles when I was about six years old was painting ultramarines. So you know the OG space. So marines. you just used to go around to his place. Yeah, because he lived with my grandpa, my grandma. So yep. um, we'd always go there for Christmases and stuff. Um, so yeah, one day, the first time I ever went in his room, I just saw all these blue models. Did on. you did you pick any models up at that point and start like painting them? Like there's a very young age to nah, get into I, it. I just, to me, back at that age, I just kind of thought they were army men, sort of cooler looking army men. Well, so, hey, army men, they are cool. army men. But, you know, <laughs> this is the this buffer. is two podcasts in a row where we've referred to. Warhammer as Army Man because that's that's what Mike liked about yeah. it as well. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Nice. I don't know if Army Man's had so much exposure as they have right now. Like, <laughs> nah, is... nah. not since Toy Story. <laughs> no, <Not really. laughs> was um, it? No, there was a different. Which was the other one? Something soldiers. Small soldiers. Small soldiers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So there was that, and then uh, once I sort of hit high school, I believe it was around two thousand and six. So I'd already, I've always known about it. I like strategy games. I'm a like thinking sort of person, so I like that kind of thing. Uh, my group of friends that I was hanging out with n- never expected it from him. I uh, was going there to hang out for the weekend and go down into his sort of basement area, um, which was like three levels of the house. So it was still you could see outside, but it was, I guess, the basement level. And he had a table set up, like a playing table. It was all flat, but it had sort of mountains painted onto it. So you could say that there was height and that kind of thing. Um, 
back then it probably wasn't as detailed, obviously, as what it is nowadays. But I mean, the the terrain nowadays is simplified. You tend to play more on the neoprene mats and then the way they ask you to set your your gaming tables out is is sort of similar in every game because the terrain plays a big part nowadays. If there's not enough terrain, then it sort of just becomes firing lanes and it's yeah. and it's and it doesn't make for a balanced game. And if there's too much terrain, it can have the the opposing effect. Yeah. But I've I've often found that there's a lot of people that are interested in Warhammer, like you were saying, your friends, they didn't come across as the type of people that were you would associate with Warhammer, I guess, because there's that sort of, um, I guess, nerd or geek stigmatism to, towards yeah, the absolutely. hobby. Even yeah. further back then, it, I guess it would have been more so, not so much now, but you, you often find that people and it kind are, of was, are into the hobby that don't, you wouldn't think and it, They were sort of like the group I was hanging out with, you know, classes that sort of the rougher side of group. Not that they were bad kids, just the kids that, you know, get in trouble in class. And the guys like that, that have smokes behind the gym, that type of. Yeah, not or? quite to that extent. More right. the kids that, you know, the, the teachers will say have ADD or whatever. But right. So, yeah, yeah we, we I went down there and we're catching up to have a weekend just hanging out with my mates. And I actually remember the first game that I watched was an Orcs versus Space Wolves. So one of my... You, you know what's funny? I think most people remember when they see their first game or whatever, they, they vividly remember which armies were, were sort of playing yeah. at the time. Like I did the same thing as well. I guess it's, it's so... It's so like exciting to watch it for the first time i think like same with anything but yeah it's, it's it just gets burned into your memory and the sculpts back then like they were good for the time like they aren't what they are now but you think they're the coolest thing you've ever seen at that time like it like if the orcs back then were those like like real you know about ba- belly out like that, arched back the funny they're like real big heads and they're, they're not like the orcs now but no nah, they still had the cool. hats on as well like the yeah. uh, khan the, not khan um uh, Mongolian yeah, yeah. and stuff. Yeah, so, um, and it just blew my mind, you know, seeing someone play a game with tape measures and dice. So I didn't understand that part of it. So we watched a game and from there I was kind of like, yeah, this this is cool. I could, I could do this. This is something different that you don't do every weekend. And so the following weekend I, it was by coincidence my birthday, maybe not the following weekend, but about a month later, and my pet, my dad was like, "What do you, what do you want for your birthday?" Warhammer, dad. And I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> I was like, get, "Get me some Warhammer." And we went down, and you know, my dad was like, oh, "Are you gonna stick to this?" When he saw it, and my first model. So the test started off with. I still remember the first model was. I believe the name of it was a Chaos Lord, and one of its arms looked like this huge dragon head cannon. Oh, you know what that was? What? A demon prince. It was the it was the Chaos Demon Prince? I don't know which it? one you're talking but about. It, yeah, it, it was smaller. Yeah, they armor. were still they were still smaller back yeah. then because, like, obviously over time they've just made models larger and larger. Yeah. But that was the Chaos Demon Prince, and the 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 cannon was sort of incorporated into the gauntlet as well. Yeah, I yeah. believe so. So I got, that's what I, it'll be. I got that, and then I actually stuck to painting that, and then I got the starter box. And that's how my journey sort of went. I stuck through it for a couple of years whilst we we're in high school. But once we sort of hit BCE age, it kind of dropped off a little bit. Hit- was was that because you didn't feel it was like it wasn't a cool thing or you didn't have friends to play with at the time or just like just interest sort of waned? Uh, a lot of us got our licenses pretty early into BCE. Yeah. Uh, not me, but a lot of the boys. So, you know, once you get cars and... The boy, especially back then for boys and like not trying to insult anyone. Girls obviously like cars, cars and girls. Too. Was it just you, cars and girls was, came around? Cars and girls came <laughs> yeah, around. Yeah, the hobby. We, the we hit, we hit that time. age where That's it was it. just like, yeah, the hobby didn't really matter. So it sort of fell off for quite a while for us. And then you know, fast forward a little bit into life, get into work, and that's obviously where I met BFG Justin. Back then he was just Justin to me. So and, yeah, so. I used to, so I work with my, I work with Mike now. For those that don't know, I work with Mike now, and I used to work with Mark. Mark was an apprentice of mine a long time ago. Now a long time. So long well, time. I've been I've been doing sign writing for twenty years. Yeah, and I think I would have been a third year. Yeah. I so mean, we met seventeen years ago. Seventeen. Yeah, it probably was about uh, about thir- no, thirteen. I you reckon? 13, 13. Years, thirteen or fourteen? Because I've been in the industry for about that long, I believe. 
But it's I been think, a while, has no. Been I think you've been longer, bro. I think you've been longer. I wasn't. Or was I qualified? Maybe I was qualified. I think you were qualified. The audience is going to start now. thinking that all hobbyists are sign writers. Yeah, they're they're all sign writers, and they all know me somehow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that checks out. Yeah, that's how you get into the hobby. That's the sort of initiation. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. yeah. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. we started working together, and then both of us hit a point where we needed to move into a house, and so. Just by coincidence, we got along at work and we were like, hey, do you want to try and do you want to get a place together? Because we both needed somewhere to live. Yeah. And so we moved in together and we both were into gaming at that point. So we started playing a lot of video games. A lot of video games. And then one day we picked up Space Marine. And me and Judd used to love that game. Every game we played, but between obviously Halo's got nothing to do with Warhammer, but between that and once we got Space Marine, that was it. You know, we played Space Marine heaps and we kept going for a long time on Space Marine. And then one day it was just, we were sitting there talking, I believe. And I was like, why, why don't we actually get into... Yeah, so funnily Warhammer? enough, we, we'd play a lot of the, the PvP stuff yeah. online in the same house and we'd just be chatting <laughs> over our audio, <laughs> just making like tyrannid noises and, and having like... All this fun. And, and the part that I loved about Space Marine, the game, was the customization. Yeah. So I think that's what finally drew me into it. And, and we would just on and off chat about how cool like Space Marines were in yeah. general. And that's when you were like, why don't we just go to... Why don't we just take this Why don't we just pop level? down to Games Workshop Ringwood? Yeah. And, and then that's obviously how Judd got into it. And from memory... My uh, from memory, I never financially recovered from that. So <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah, <laughs> I've been chasing. I've been chasing my tail ever since. Now. <laughs> and from memory, from that, Judd, that's when you got into Tau. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, Tau was my first army. That's yeah. what we spoke about on the the first the first ever podcast. Yeah. Uh, it, it was strange. Like Space Marines, I really loved at the time, but as soon as I walked in, Tau's what drew me drew me in because i've never played space marine the game yep. can you play can you play as tau and all the different factions nah. so basically you're... space marine the first one you played a story as leon captain leonidas yeah i believe so it's ringing a bell but i could be wrong so don't hold us to it yeah oh titus captain Cap- titus, captain titus. Uh, leonidas yeah, was yeah, a dude yeah, yeah. so titus was in it and you play through the story mode as an ultramarine and after you finish the story mode you start to Start to play the PvP sort of stuff. All the the um, I very much like the survival mode in PVE, and you yep. could create your own chapter Space Marine. So you could go obviously Codex and follow all that. There were also purchasable skins, so like pre-made like Blood Angels or uh, I think a Salamander as well. Yeah. And that's what we played an absolute ton of was the PvP. It was so you just you, so fun. You play you play the whole game as Space Marines. Yeah, you convince them to go down to. Games Workshop, yeah, and then like, he picked Tau. Yep. What did you pick? I went Grey Knights. Uh, I liked the thought of uh, how they were psychers that like to fight demons. demons. And I thought that was pretty cool because I did, obviously, back when I was in high school, Grey Knights never used to be their own army. They used to be incorporated as a attachment for Space Marines. They were like a, like a really, really elite yeah, attachment? They were, yeah, they were like one yeah. of the strong sort of Space Marines. And so when I saw that they were with their own thing, I was like, this is cool. i got to do these guys. But they, it was one of the, and for me as well, it was an army where, because Grey Knights were quite expensive per squad. Mm-hmm. So for, you know, for Judd, just say comparing Fire Warriors to the basic Grey Knights, you know, Judd would get a lot more fire warriors. And, and that was sort of the appeal for me because uh, I had that thought of, oh, I'd like to actually get an army that I can paint up. So a more elite army yeah, feels like it's painting less. It's yes, sort of yeah. like it, it does feel like it's painting less, but I, I recently found when I did a, a Termagant for a tutorial, I was like, this went quicker because it took me like four hours to paint one. And that was sort of like speed painting for me. But the equivalent Termagant is basically like um, four Termagants are like one Marine. Yeah. So you yeah. feel like you're painting less, <laughs> but in actual fact, you're sort of, you're still painting the same in terms of hours of, of painting. Yeah. I think this little dog wants to leave. I'm not sure. Are you okay, Zeta? I thought she was going to fall asleep. Well, hopefully she does. Well, I'll just, we'll see how we go. Con- continue on with you. You're cool, cool as elite. Grey Knights, yeah, so which which have got some reinforcements lately. They got Castle and Crow 
as a model, but yeah, yeah, they, they yeah, definitely... We won't go down paths that I don't need to start venturing down again because as I was about to go into... Well, <laughs> they, they, their, their models are a bit dated now. Yeah. They definitely need a bit of love from Games Workshop. Say, it, sounds like, it sounds like Justin was trying to repay the favour to get you to uh, spend all your money. The, no, no, no. I, I'm a, you know me. I like people painting armies. And he does, he I've, does. I've seen your current project and I'm... Trying to trying to uh, motivate been. you to to paint that. Absolutely, he has. Uh, but we, I did, especially uh, when me and Judd were living together. I used to go down that hole of I'd see a model that I like and I'd buy it, <laughs> even if it didn't fit in my army. So it got to a stage where my room was full of boxes. <laughs> The models pile, I thought looked potential. Cool. Pot, yeah, so, yeah. And there was more of a pile of, pile of potential is an understatement. You probably could have built houses on the yeah, yeah. Of mountain, mountain, yeah. Of yeah, for, mountain for, of potential. For, for those that would normally hear the, the, the regular term for it is a pile of shame, but I like to sort of put a positive spin on it because they are always models that are there to paint. And I, I did the same thing as you. Yeah. I got in the hobby and I started doing tower and then I just picked models that I really like the look of. And it was really good for my painting. Like I, I, I advanced my painting really fast because I was extremely motivated. But at the same time, it does hurt the back pocket because yeah. you're just buying models and you don't really ever end up with a playable army. Yeah, that's the issue with it. If you want to, if you want to advance with painting, then it's a very good thing to do. But if you want to play games with a painted army, then you sort of need to knuckle down and. That's exactly what I was going to say. If you're just doing the hobby because you like the look of models and you're more looking just for a display case and you, you can sort of afford within reason to buy models from different armies that you do like the look of. But if you're looking at doing a playable army, definitely I would say stick to that army because it can be... <laughs> uh, it's exciting, but it's just you want to get that army painted and it's satisfying getting an army painted for sure. It's, yep. that, it's that extra level of enjoyment out of the hobby as well. Like instead of just the painting time, you then get to enjoy your models on the battlefield playing like playing with them like yep. like you wanted to as a kid sort of thing. Like, no, I think absolutely. that's... I don't think there's... A, I'm, I'm trying to think of a comparable sense of achievement that you can get from completing a project and there's just... It's just amazing how you feel when you finish painting like a sizable 1500 to 2000 point army and then you can play it on the tabletop. It's just such oh. a good feeling. And then if you find someone to play with who has the same, the immersion in the game is so good. Yeah. I just, it's obviously what I'm about when it comes to this side of the hobby. It's kind of a double bonus, isn't it? You paint models, you get better at painting models. So you see progress within yourself and within the models and then you can put those models on the table and actually play with them. So it's not like something that you just pick up, you paint, it goes to the back of your cupboard and you never see it again. It's something that you can act, it's actually usable once you achieve it yep. as well. So which makes it, like I said, a bonus being able to play with tape measures and dice. It's if, if for people that if you tune in and you've never played a game of Warhammer, it's actually quite exciting when yep. you do it. It's very exciting. Yeah. So we'll go back to where you were with your Grey Knights before I was derailed you with the, with the new models. <laughs> so I picked up some Tau yep. and you picked up some Grey Knights. Yep. And then where did you go from there? I was obviously madly painting stuff. Early on it wasn't that great, but. So from there I painted the original box. I forget what they were called, but it was a squad of five. I do remember that. Um, Terminator armor or just regular power armor? No, it was just the regular power armor. Might have just been Strike the, Knights, I think. Uh, that's exactly what it was called, the Strike Knights. And then I I started reading into the law. I like law of things. And funny enough, uh, Blood Angels caught my eye. And that's when I bought a box of Sanguinary Guard. I'm very much into sort of either either end of angelic or demonic sort of things when it comes to the hobby. So I saw these the only sort of angel looking things, I guess, at the time that was in the hobby. And I was like, yeah, I've, I've got to get a box of these. And I try, I'm try. i someone that tries to be different. So I saw that they were gold. I'm like, you know what? I've got grey knights. I've got silver paints. Let's paint these silver. Yep. So I did the silver sanguinary guard and got into my blood angels. It's got a bit of uh, a ring to it, silver sanguinary. It does. <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> they it are does. called the angelic host as well too, I believe, when there's just like copious amounts of sanguinary guard. Oh, there's yeah. none left now. I think this dog wants to go to you, I believe. Come on. Yep. There we right. go. Right. So, um, swapping doggos. 
Yeah, so I don't think there's any sanguinary guard right now in the yep. law. So that is that's that's actually quite good for potential future models. Yes, that's because because they need reinforcement somehow. And I'm thinking, Games Workshop, you're gonna miss you, you're actually gonna miss the the ball on this one if you don't release them with the next Blood Angel Codex. So <laughs> that's what <laughs> just, just passionate, a passionate, thinly, <laughs> thinly veiled threat, Games Workshop. <laughs> passionate Blood Angel player wants Sanguinary Guard. Please. <laughs> and Gabriel Seth too because he's badass. He is true. And <laughs> then from there it kind of just, to be honest, ventured I could go through all the sort of armies that I bought a little bit and pieces from but we'd, we'd be here all day and then I did have a break from the hobby for a while uh, just due to work commitments, moving away. Yep. Um, Judd was obviously having a housemate at the time that was also into the same hobby that I was into uh made it a lot easier to paint you know when you got your mate that you can come home and you sit there and you paint together even if you're not in the same room like we're saying we you can yell out across the house and be like check this out or run into the other room that is is something i have been sort of promoting on stream some people have even said it in whilst whilst i've been painting they're just like it it makes it easier for them because sometimes they don't have someone to paint with so if they jump on stream whilst i'm painting then yeah, you got you that. You can just paint away at the same 100%, time. It's almost 100%. like someone's there with you. Absolutely do that. Um, that's what I do uh, when Judd's on stream. That's how I've recently got back into it is I try and paint, whether it's painting or putting my models together because then I'm also listening to the advice that Judd gives. It, Judd stuck to it a lot better than I did. And then, yeah, so here we are now. I've got back into the hobby. Necromunda got me back into it. Yeah. Actually, no, sorry. I apologize. Uh, Age of Sigma. I came over and Judd and a bunch of the boys were playing some Age of Sigma and we hadn't actually caught up in quite a while and then I saw her and I was like, ah, oh, I miss this. <laughs> That's I miss, the I miss, stuff. Yeah. I, miss, I miss the <laughs> it's dice all, it, rolling. It's always the way, you know, like people, like, I've, I've had a few breaks in the hobby but yeah. you often find that people will give it up but there's always sort of that, it's always in the back of your mind. Again, not to always touch on the stream, but that's where I get a lot of interaction with other hobbyists. Is people come in and they're just like, "Hey, I used to do this 15 years ago," and then they come back for a second or third stream, and then on the fourth stream, they're like, "I just pulled all my stuff out of the cabinet, which is great. Or, out of the cupboard, and I'm and I'm starting to paint it again." That's so, so good. Yeah, so but good. It's it it sort of always remains there, I think, and it just needs you just need a little thing to tip you over the edge, and you're back into the hobby because it's such a good hobby. Oh, like, it is. Like, <laughs> Obviously, we're doing a podcast about it. Like, um, we're not going to come in here and can the hobby. It's an amazing hobby and, yeah. Even when I wasn't doing it, if I walk past the uh, Games Workshop, what's now Warhammer, or even any shops that had p- painted models in the window, I'd always stop and have a look. And I was like, ah, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. But it, literally the one thing that was probably stopping me was I didn't really have anyone to do it with. So yeah. it's like I didn't I didn't want to make that investment if I'm just going to sit there at home and not have anyone to at least play with uh, with my final results or discuss it. It makes it even better being able to discuss it where I think that your TikTok's great because you can express, ask questions. Yeah, it's like instant. It's interactive, yeah. So And there's lots of people that are interactive on it. So that's definitely helped. And so we did Age of Sigma. I collected Flesh Eater Courts, which are cool. I just... Before anyone asks, I'm very anti-human characters. I don't like painting skin of people. That's probably one of my icks. So. That's a lot of skin, though, bro. <laughs> Flesh eater courts <laughs> is just all skin, yeah, but not but not human. Not human skin. So, I, well, I, they I, were they were once human. they were once, once human, yeah. but not anymore. So, um, then from Flesh Eater Courts, we went into Necromunda, which I went into Delac, as people that watched Judd's TikToks would have seen. The, the yeah, we games. did have a few games. Yeah, we yeah. did have a few games. With the uh the terrifying narc ghouls, absolutely terrifying. They um just pop up anywhere on the board and just yes. remove whatever they want. And the pesky bee, the pesky bee the was pesky my uh, MVP. Yeah. Yes, the lack of very good. They yeah. are very good. And then obviously tenth edition came out, and uh, here we are. And one of my things that I never wanted to do was paint a horde army, but just so, so what'd you pick? You went back with grey knights then. Or Custodes, oh, okay. the opposite. Yeah, yeah. Custodes are super elite. Yeah. Oh, no, I went, uh, the, those big mechs, what are those called? The, uh, the, so I can pay. Imperial and, Knights. Yeah, yeah. Nah, what I've actually chose to go is Tyranids. So. <laughs> the good thing about Tyranids is you don't have to go down the swarm route, though. No, absolutely not. So you could. You could if you so choose, but is, is that where you're going? Do you have an idea of your list yet or are you just sort of paying uh, up stuff you like? So 
my list uh, for me with the hobby, I need to paint things that I like the look of or have interest in. I'm not technically someone that wants to play to win. Obviously, everyone likes to win, but I I'm going with the models that I like, and then I'll look also look into make sure if they're at least a viable in some sense. It's similar to where I'm sense. at. Yeah, I don't want to take the strongest list, but I don't want my opponent to just wipe Table me off. The, I, yeah. I want my opponent to have a good game at least. Yes, because like. You don't want to hand someone empty when there's no sort of gratification in that. I, I don't. I don't think there is anyway. Oh, and no, that could definitely uh, bring you down in the mood of the hobby. I reckon if like you try to put a list, imagine painting an army, and this isn't me trying to put people off again, but uh, I, I, I would not like to paint an army where I get tabled on turn two or something. And no, no like, definitely oh, not. Well, I think every, everyone's trying like what captures the imagination other than the the aesthetic of the models I think is those that promise of the epic battle. Yeah. And like that's been my most like exciting times is when when we've been playing like Necromander and it's just been neck and neck. Like it's just a sort of story unfolding on on the board. In front of yeah, right in front of your eyes. Like and you just don't know which how it's gonna end. Like it's not scripted. It's just you have no idea how how it's gonna go and yeah. It's all just a roll of the dice. I was going to say, it's exciting when you're sitting there and you're like, I need at least two fives or sixes. 100%. And you've got one third in a chance of getting the dice roll that you need. Or even if it's you need a six and you've got two dice, you need one six to do a wound and that's going to take a model off the field. Yeah. And you get that six. It's, it's every, exhilarating. Every it now is. and every now and then, and like this probably excludes Justin because he can't roll to save his <laughs> life. But... <laughs> Every now that and again, that, that is true. That is true. That is true. I don't want to. I don't want to talk up my blood angel dice, but they've been going okay. Oh, they're running hot. The blood angel. No, let's not say hot. Is microwaved him? Let, <laughs> let's not say hot, but they've been at least mathematical for me. Is amazing. Is that amazing. is amazing. That's yeah. that's that's huge. Yeah. <laughs> People think it's a joke until they see me roll dice. You know, like. Yeah, it's it's not a joke. When when I roll ten dice and eight of them end up being ones and twos, <laughs> and it's just I I I and that's I expect I yeah I I expect it too. Like I <laughs> I fully expect it, and oh every time I do, it, I'm like classic Judd, classic Judd, because it's I just expect it. Every not time. even disappointed. You're like yeah no, yeah that checks out. Yep. <laughs> As long as these things will look good on the tabletop for yeah, like, they for look amazing. Two turns. <laughs> but hey, you never know. Maybe Murphy is going to kick in, and that's where it all changes at Ark. Ooh, mm. let's mm. not talk that up too much. <laughs> let's not talk that up too much. <laughs> yeah. So, does it feel? I'm interested. Does it feel different the second time around? Obviously, having a bit of a break and then rolling back into the the Nid Army. Is this fourth time around? At, at actually, uh third. Third, no, fourth. officially no, third. No, yeah, officially fourth. fourth. Yeah, yeah. It's probably fourth time around <laughs> getting back into it. Um, it does feel good. It it feels better having a bit more of an understanding of it as well. When obviously when in your teenage years, especially getting back into it, even when me and Judd were living together, um, didn't put the time in to learn the rules. I guess so. It was kind of like like giving it a go still putting the time in but not quite understanding the rules yeah that makes sense so now having that effort put into it where i'm looking into the rules and stuff a bit more so i've got an understanding of the game mechanics it's it's the more you look into it the more exciting it is i think and i've got the time to look into it now yeah yeah on that on that note of getting back into the hobby and sort of starting again i think would be a good time to talk about things we wish we knew when we got into the hobby. So I think we'll have like a list of sort of equipment we wish we knew to start with because quite often when you get into the hobby, you're not – you're new to it so you don't really know anything. And when you go to Games Workshop, they sort of teach you the basics but I feel like there's a few things on top of that that would be helpful. We may miss a few things because we're, yeah, we're only human yeah. but – I sort of did start writing a little bit of a list which we might go through, but feel free to f- jump in. We might just start with equipment. Like you're you're still relatively new to it, Mike, and, and you're back into it. So I might let you guys sort of take the lead on what equipment you th- you think would be helpful in the hobby or what you've – like maybe you, Mark, because it's your fourth time around. So <laughs> you've probably learned a few things. What What type of equipment do you think people who are just starting out should have and may not have been told to have. A uh, big one is a wet palette, I think. 
Uh, that's something I've only recently got onto, which if people aren't aware of what a wet palette is, it's like a, I guess a sponge kind of sub, like it's pretty much a sponge isn't yep. it, at the yep. bottom. And then it's kind of similar to baking paper, but not quite. I won't say baking paper because baking paper can hold water off it. I'm yeah. So sure. I've, I've made a homemade wet palette before. Okay. Yep. With baking paper and a sponge. And so you can worked. just, yeah, and okay, you can just yep. moisten it and just put your baking that's, paper. Yeah, that's what I have a, currently. Yeah, okay. find, <laughs> yeah cool. find a little container to do it. And I guess the reason that doesn't get pushed that much from Games Workshop is they don't currently have one of their wet pallets in their equipment range. Yeah. So they won't generally promote it. You know, the manager of the store may eventually tell someone to do it. I, I found that especially in Australia with our climate, our hot climate, it's almost a necessity, especially yeah, once you start getting around spring and summer, your paints will dry out way too fast. So it's not so much being able to put the lid on and then come back and use the paint. You might be able to do that in really, really cold environments, but it's more so just the workability of the paint whilst you are painting your models. I started off with just the little plastic one from Games Workshop, the palette, and your paint would dry out within five minutes and you'd be yeah. getting more paint out. Yeah. No, and especially when you're when you're first starting out, like you're taking your time, maybe. <laughs> I know I didn't when I first started, but you might be like reading a little bit about how to paint and then going back to your palette and things like that. So yeah. The more time you can have that paint usable, the the better it's gonna be for you in the long run. So yeah, yeah. yeah the wet palette is a great a great call. I think I think it helps you when you thin your paint to keep it that consistency too. If anything, your your paint will separate a bit more. So you might have to add some more paint to it. I often find that with my edge highlights because I don't thin my edge highlights a lot because I want them to cover. Yep. But it, do, it will help you with like base coats and stuff, keeping the, the paint thin and workable. That's exactly like, what like you want. Say. It helps yeah. keep the paint thin yep. because it's got the water that's yep. already in it instead of having to add it to it yep. if you're using a dry palette. Yeah. Any other – like I've got a good – I've got a little comprehensive list over here. Is there anything else you guys think of? Discussed. Yeah. Hundred percent. You got. I, I like the the scalpel. The blunt scalpel was a good tip from you, just for the building stage. Yeah, for mold lines and stuff. Yeah, for mold yeah. lines, hundred percent. So I think with me, I sort of, I didn't even realize you could do that when I first started. So the mold, the, line, the, the, mold line removal. Yeah, or that you should do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that that one was a massive one for me because that that really takes away from the model being a plastic casting and being more lifelike, being more realistic. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so and and having the blade a little bit blunt, which will, it'll happen over time. So it's not like you have to go and rub it on the concrete or anything like that. But yeah, um, it happens pretty quick. It does happen pretty quick. Yeah, and that that sort of just stops you from taking off too much material. I think. Yeah. Is is the big the big part of it being a, a little bit dull. Um, and then yeah, the other one with the build process was drilling the barrels. I'll, I'll touch on those scalpels just quickly. Oh yeah. Yeah. So the thing I I think most people should have is potentially two scalpels. So you have one sharp one for when you're clipping the model off the sprue and then you can clean you can clean the contact point off with the sharper scalpel just to get a nice clean removal of it and then you can use the the blunt one to do the mold line removal and the the beauty of using a scalpel for your mold line removal I've found is it'll reach a lot more areas than the mold line removal from games workshop because they're quite chunky whereas you can get the scalpel into a lot more sort yeah, well, it's of delicate got such areas. A, it's got a, such a fine point. Yeah, That's yeah. Really, really I, don't, I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think it's a necessity from the start of the hobby, but to go hand in hand with scalpels is the sandpaper pads, which you could pick up sandpaper pads from some hobby stores. I don't think Games Workshop sell them anymore, or you could go to Bunnings and just buy yourself some twelve hundred and thousand grit. And just cut them up into little pieces. That's I really like the foam ones. You've a got, lot. Though. The foam ones are extremely yeah, handy. Yeah. Are those hobby store ones or are they're they? hobby store ones? They're God Hand, the brand. I think that's the brand that gets used for Gumpler a lot. Yeah, but they are expensive. So I think it's like twelve dollars AUD for a little pack of four to six yeah, or something six like that. Four, yeah. So you're paying you're paying a fair amount of money just for some little sandpaper pads, but they are very good. They How are do they good. last? I, I know I not been, very long. No. Yeah. Been, not very long, but it, it with with just the even the scalpel and the sandpaper. What you guys are talking about that's that's a small step which helps people level up their painting, but as well with huge the cleaner paint, yeah, huge. The, the how the paint goes on and not seeing mold lines and stuff. It just it levels it up to a next level, a hundred percent. The more effort you put into painting, the more 
the areas you haven't built to a higher standard will be visible. Yep. Absolutely. So the more effort you go in with your building goes hand in hand with the effort you put in painting. Yep. That's right. right. It's all about that preparation. Yep. Which we'll, uh, we've got something we'll talk about uh, in terms of what I have listed here. Things we wish we knew. When we get to that, that will touch on and the point we just spoke yeah, about yeah. then as well. So, Yeah, nice one. I've got another thing I think is very big is adequate lighting whilst you're painting, which these can all seem like extremely sort of simple ideas that you should think of, but sometimes you don't think of this when you're getting into the hobby. You should have... And I I did it. I just picked up two lamps from Kmart, very cheap ones. Make sure you get daylight you. globes as well. Bless you. Because daylight globes or the daylight is where you're going to see most of your models. So you want to get a true, accurate representation of what your colors are. Yep. You should be getting a daylight globe because you get that that cold blue office light and you paint your models. You'd be like, yo, these look really, really cool. Then you'll put them on a tabletop and you're like, that's not the color I wanted at all. And... The same can be said about the the warm colors. Sort of to the lamps for people that can see our lamps. I'll just keep knocking absolutely everything here. Um, <laughs> the warm colors will do the same thing. So make sure you get a daylight globe because that will will give you a real. True yeah, I think I think these list, like these little little helping tips and things like that are almost a necessity when you start now. Like I couldn't go back to painting without two lamps in a dull lit room or anything like yeah. that. Like it would yeah. just be a night. I just, I wouldn't enjoy it anywhere but near as much yeah. as I do. We're saying that as well. Don't let that deter you off the hobby either. No, no, this of is course some not. advice that as Judd said, he, we, all of us, I, I don't know about Mike himself, but we all got our lamps from Kmart and yeah. they weren't an expensive lamp. So yeah. When when we're throwing these ideas, and same with the sponge. With I, the st- I still use, paper. I yeah. still use my Kmart lamps. Uh, that's what's on my Mine was Amazon. Well. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah. And this is for this is for painting, like yes. for building and painting. Just so so people know, it's not it's not for it's not so much for the gaming side of it. This is for if you're wanting to paint your army stuff. We wish we knew and equipment, obviously. And the people, if, if you if you're going to game, then and the get, get yourself a tape measure. Are looking at your paint and how you paint. So the advice that you're we're giving today is to optimize that quality of paint. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Um, I've got some other stuff here. So good brushes. I think a good brush, don't be, don't be afraid if you're new to the hobby about getting a new brush. It will help you out a lot, especially if you're trying to do some like fine recess shading, the pin shading that I do or edge highlights, a good brush will help you out with that a heap. Oh yeah. There's just going to be times where you've got one of the, just average brushes and you're just not going to be able to do some stuff. So it definitely won't like you won't transform into Picasso when you've got a new a brush and they're a little bit more expensive, but they will help you level up your, your skills in terms of painting for sure. And an issue, I don't know if you've ever used the sort of cheaper brushes, but an issue I did notice with if I've used cheaper brushes, which I have at times is the hairs can actually pull out. Yeah. So you end up with the hairs in your paint and yeah. when you try and pull the hair out. Yeah, you definitely don't want that. You definitely nah, don't want that. It's not fun. So I occasionally use synthetic brushes. I pick some up from Officeworks to do some base coats of metallics yep. because metallics can be quite sort of damaging to to brushes. So I don't – I try not to use my, my good brushes on metallics unless I really have to. So you could look at doing some synthetic stuff for base coats and, and, and things like that. But a good brush if you want to start doing some detailed – edge highlights and eyes if you're going to paint some eyes the better the brush the easier it's going to be that's for sure they're difficult i find them very hard as well yeah and they do seem to like the higher quality like brushes do seem to last if you look well. after them. yeah if you've got if you've got a water pot water pot to wash them out in and you look after them then they last for ages i've i think i've still got one brush from my second time that's still pretty yeah. good yeah so yeah i don't know if you were trying to set up a segue there to the, the next what piece of equipment. Maybe. But water pots? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, nice. I didn't you, know that You was were? Fun. Were you trying to set that <laughs> yeah, up? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> well, you can set you. We're just, you know, connected. <laughs> yeah. Water pots, what about them? They're good. Yep. No, nah, they're great. So definitely water pots. And also the tip you gave me was have a separate one for your metallics as well so yep. that you don't completely get metallics. Yep, two water pots. Two yep. water pots, yeah. So the Games Workshop water pots are actually really, really good. They've got like a ribbed bottom which helps clean the brush when you're, when you're like stirring it in the pot where you can, like you can definitely use a little mug or a cup or something but I find the ribs at the bottom of the pot help clean the brush even more. 
think I've just learned something today. Yeah. So. Well, I didn't know this either because like even even if you are using thin down paints, you still get flecks of paints that will dry higher up on the brush, Yeah. on the filament. And when I was painting, first painting with Justin, he was like, are you cleaning the brush properly? I'm like, yeah, man, I'm dipping it in the water. He's like, no, you really want to like smash it over the ribs there to to get out any little flecks of whatever the older paint was. Yeah. And, and that helps the brush last. And I was, I was so terrified about breaking these or damaging these brushes. And he's like, no, if you're just rubbing it over the ribs, they'll, they'll be fine. Yeah. They're fine, Mike. Looks yeah. like I'm getting some water pots tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think they're actually reasonably priced as well. Oh, well they're the actual water that's pots. going to be better than my SpongeBob mug, so... Yeah, probably. <laughs> Won't, might not look as cool though. So, I don't know, a bit of a trade-off. Well, you could off. paint SpongeBob on it. <laughs> this is not so much equipment, but it is in terms of the brush care. Yeah. With your water pots, I get into the habit of rinsing my water pot out before every hobby session. Okay, yep. And this comes up on stream regularly about brush care. People always ask about it. I don't think you need to be crazy with your brush care. You can get like chemicals to clean your brushes. But I simply like having fresh water in a pot because if you think about cleaning your brush in your water pot, often you're putting paint into that water. So then when you're cleaning your brush out, you actually there's pigments in that water that you're cleaning your brush out in. So the cleaner water, the better. And do it often. If you're doing like fine detailed stuff with the edge highlights, Clean your brush often. Don't be afraid to do it like, you know, every five minutes, even even more often. I'll, I'll clean it out very often on stream. And with the big with the the big difference between having the the two water pots is it it's mainly the metallic yep. actually leaves the flakes. Yeah, so that'll stay in your pot. The, okay. the metallic flakes will 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 over time just stay in your pot, and then you don't want them to contaminate your regular colors. Say you're painting some a black armored marine or something. All of a sudden, there's like these shiny little flecks. And I, I varnished my models, but there's going to be like little flecks of metallic throughout the whole black armor yeah. and it will be visible. That makes sense. And you don't want that. So so two two water pots, yeah. two water pots. We might just do a little list at the end so people can just write them down quickly and be like this, this, Absolutely. this, this. Yeah. Yeah. What else you got? What else you got on your list? Then? What else have I got on my list? Let me have a look. Let me have a look. <laughs> Actually, Mark came up with this one and I didn't even think about it. So paint handles. Oh, instead nice, of handling yeah. your models, right? Instead of handling your models and painting them like this, and you can do that if you want, that's fine, as long as you hold the base. But you'll start to find that, I do it occasionally, you, you still grab the model and paint handles help with that articulation and reaching a whole bunch of areas. You don't need to get the Games Workshop ones or I think there's a bunch of other brands. They're fantastic. You could just use the patented BFG paint handle and just get yourself... A nice wash pot, the 24 mil pots. Yep. Put a bit of blue tack on there. I use the Bostic brand, Bostic, if you're watching this. If you're watching, yeah, Bostic, <laughs> just in case. Please supply me with $2 worth of blue tack. <laughs> and then, um, what's yeah, the just blue, put, blue tacks. Uh, is it $4? Yeah, what's the, what's the, what's the, in, what's the other name for blue tack? Post attack and post attack, sticky tack for international listeners. Sticky tack. Sticky tack. D- it depends on where you're located. Yeah. In Australia, it's just called blue tack and it's gray, it's not blue. But you just place that on top of your... I was going to say the way for like international people to maybe understand what it is if we haven't got all the names is like normally people put posters up in their rooms with it and stuff like that. So if there's a name that we've missed if, in case you're curious of what the blue blue tack is yeah. that we're talking yeah. about, that's... The small that's putty like, that you yeah, use to hold that's up a, posters. That's, there you go, the putty, yeah. 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 And I've never had issue with blue tack removing paint from a model. No. So that's why you'll see me on stream literally putting a painted area and sticking it in the blue tack. So I don't have to touch it with my hand and, and rotating it to paint a different area. So you can make your own little homemade paint handle. Yeah. Or so you can use the Games Workshop ones because they are very good. The Games oh, Workshop absolutely. ones with the clips are good. And then there's, I guess, the more high-level paint handles. I'm not sure of the brand of them, but they've actually got a big wire that comes up over the edge. So you can put your finger on top of it and hold it as well. And it just really helps you to be able to reach a lot of different areas. The, the big boys use them, you know, like the the, the golden demon painters and stuff like okay, that. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. I really like the. But it doesn't mean you can't workshop. do it, Mike. You could do it. Me too. Yep. Awesome. Anyone can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. That's Thank right. <laughs> but yeah, I really like that the the games workshop handle. I think that's awesome. And then yeah, the 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 post attack blue tack system seems to work as well. Like another little tip with that is, I remember getting blue tack sort of stuck on my model, and then you're like. 
oh, if that happens, you just get more blue tack. Blue tack, yeah. Blue tack takes off blue tack. As long as it's clean. As long as it's clean. You don't want to use old shitty blue tack. I've got that and I, I use that to prime my models. That holds the models down when I prime them because I don't care about the paint going on them. But new blue tack is what you want to do if you're doing like yeah. your, your painted stuff. Blue tack plus blue tack equals no blue tack. Or Yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> who, who, know, who knew? Who would have thought it? <laughs> so that, that's the end of my equipment list. There's obviously way more equipment. But I think that's some of the basics you sort of need. Oh, yeah. Sorry, there was one. Did you mention that? Yeah, I was going to set that up. Oh, clippers? Yeah, the clippers. Yeah, get yourself it, yeah. a good oh, pair yeah. of clippers to clip out your, your sprues. Sorry. To cut they you don't off. have to be super expensive either. Mine, no. mine were $10. You can get the, I think there's God Hand ones, the, the same brand as that sandpaper. And they're like crazy, crazy price. But what they do is essentially just shear it clean as and you would have very minimal cleanup afterwards. Yeah. So if you've got expendable income to be able to do it, because some people do, like some people don't and some people do. If you've got it and you want to get some real nice clippers, look at the God Hand stuff because that'll save you a lot of cleanup time. That'll save you heaps of cleanup time. Yeah, those are handy though because they come to a really fine point as well and they – they're really good for getting them off the sprue. Like if you're trying to get them off with regular household scissors, I would imagine it would be really messy. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, Please don't do don't. that. <laughs> I don't know. People for those that just heard Mike say that. <laughs> Please forget what he just said. I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> did you use to... household scissors when you're younger? Maybe you did. I don't know. I mean, maybe. There's people out there doing it. I, so I probably don't, shouldn't. Please probably don't shouldn't. try and just push it off either. Because just will, rip it off. Yeah, yeah it'll stuff it. Yeah. Just snap it off. Get yourself some clippers. Yeah. Ten bucks. You can get yeah. them for ten bucks. Yeah. You can get probably 100%. get them from Etsy as well. Bunnings. I've got super craft ones from Bunnings. And they work good. Yeah, they're fine. I would have had to use either household scissors or a knife as a child, like when I was twelve. I don't remember steak knife sawing at it. Yeah, which just, just which don't, the kit, which don't the do, don't do. No steak knives to cut your models off. That's very people. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have so many angry letters from mums that are just like, my kid is just cutting all this plastic with my steak. Knife. No, no, they're not. They're using clippers. Yeah, yeah. use some kids clippers. at home. You use clippers. So I think that's that's a good that's a good little. List Absolutely. for people to to uh, to work on. I'll, I'll I'll just I'll run through it. Yeah, quickly it, so yeah. people can just write it down. I'll need my notes here. So adequate lighting, so lamps, daylight globes, a wet palette, good brushes, two water pots, a paint handle, and clippers. Is That's that it? Good. Yeah. Scalpels. The, yeah, scalpels. The scalpels yeah. as well. Two scalpels. Uh, uh, yeah, as a base, as like a basis. Yeah, that's really good for yep. the hobby. So, absolutely. Yeah. So with the equipment done, I think now we'll just move on to the knowledge thing. So things that you wish you knew. <laughs> so much. <laughs> so many things. I might just um, I might just grab this little dog for a second. Dog is about you, to you, go you'll crazy have to people, you'll have to you continue on here, Mike, without me for a second. So. Yeah. I'll, I'll grab the little dog and we'll get her out of the room because her mum's home. You can and, see, um, look at she's dog really excited up right now. <laughs> like someone's here to save me from the podcast. But yeah, I think this one will be a really obvious one for a lot of people except for me was thinning my paints. When I first started, I had no idea that thinning your paints was an option. Like I didn't, I had no idea. No clue that thinning your paints was an option and it just makes it so much easier. Like instead of trying to lay this super thick layer... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> Rumor has it I don't thin my paints either. <laughs> if you've seen some of the comments on YouTube lately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. Well, yeah, if you, if, if you want your work to... No, I was, I was about to say something really crazy just then. <laughs> I was going to say, if you want your work to turn out like Justin, don't thin your paints. But yeah. that's not the situation <laughs> at all. But yeah, thinning paints, big one. The, the thing about thinning paints is you can get told and get shown on a video often how to thin paints, but until you actually learn yourself through trial and error, you, you, you never really you never really get an idea. Like if you've got someone in person to show you, that can help because that's what I did with you, Mike. I showed you in person and you're like, oh, I get it, I get it. And I've tried to get that across on stream a couple of times but you never truly know until you start painting yourself. And certain paints can be thinned less than other paints. So and and that exam and yeah. the, the example is on my videos where I do some tutorials, I don't thin the black down that much. Because it actually covers really well and and very smoothly, especially when you put a varnish over the top. It's almost flawless. But you'll find the lighter colors, if you're doing multiple layers, you definitely need to thin that stuff a bit more. Yeah, 100%. I'm not a fan of lighter colors personally because of that reason. <laughs> Some, sometimes you just have to do them though. Sometimes yeah, you, you just do. have to do them. Yeah, I think I've got another one on there where 
also moving fairly quickly with the paint so you know you don't let it dry on the model too quickly because if you if you continue to work it too much you start getting a chalkier sort of finish and an unsmooth finish yeah so a lot of people tend to have that issue they'll or it'll be re-layering so they'll they'll paint the model and they due to like a lack of patience which i always try and tell people to have some patience with their models due to a lack of patience they'll start applying a second layer so they're doing the right thing by applying multiple layers but the first layer isn't completely dry like you said where you start putting wet paint on a semi-dried area and it'll ball up and have a chalky effect so to get nice smooth layers you need to a thin the paint and b wait for the previous layers to dry otherwise you will have a few issues that's right and that's as simple as going off and painting a different part of the model or painting a different model you know if, if you're impatient like a lot of us are yeah there's there's workarounds yep totally anything else i've got a big big list here no, no there's only like four things there's only the, like the four one things. that i brought up that yeah bring totally up uh time management with the hobby especially for me uh is a big one a good one especially people watching is what i try and do now is where i said a little bit earlier if but it slipped out is once Judd starts streaming, that's kind of my point then to maybe, even if it's for an hour, just trying to dedicate a little bit of time to the hobby. So then you stick with it and it's consistent with. So f forming a habit. Yes. So yeah. this is where, this is where a little bit of the, this is where when you're lacking motivation, forming that habit and, and turning into dedication will help. Doing streams for me makes it much easier to paint more consistently. And that, that's not because it's forcing me. It's because I like to help people and come on stream and do that. So like I like being consistent and dedicated. So I, I tend to paint a lot. And I've got I've got the time there to, to do it. Like you said, you need to allocate time to do it. So which yeah. and, and you you know how much time you've got. A lot of people I think make excuses up. And like not trying to sound harsh, you'd just be like, oh, I just don't have time. To, don't have time to paint. I yeah. don't have time to paint. But you haven't made the time to paint to do it. And people have kids and stuff like that. I completely understand. But you don't need to do big, big paint sessions. You can you can squeeze 20 minutes in. Oh, absolutely. It's if, if you're finding, for me, it's how I've learned to put some time towards the hobby is if I'm trying to realize if you're, wasting time in something where if you're into the hobby you could be using that time on the hobby instead yep. of wasting that time doing something that's pointless obviously like life happens but if you're doing something that's pointless that you're not achieving anything for you know like you said 20 minutes half an hour that 20 minutes half an hour can get that model that next stage closer to being completed and yeah all it takes literally as well with that is you get one model done you just get your get your first model done and the growth from that is massive personally yep. for me. That's where I I had noticed my growth in painting. When you get one model done and you see that finished product. You put it in front of you. Yeah, you're like, wow. And then you once you expand from that, that's when that's when you'll really sort of grow as a hobbyist. Yep. I, I personally believe not though in that I'm not stepping too far ahead or anything. No, go go say. for your so, life, man. You can you, you go go for it. So Definitely. The more the more time you put into it, the more time that you will then want to dedicate to it. So making it a part of, I guess, your life if you want to do the hobby, it, it's really it's really important. It's taken me a while. I work a lot, as, as Judd knows, but and it's 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 relaxing for you as well. It can take you away from the craziness of your life. Just getting that model in front of you, like Judd said, twenty minutes. Twenty minutes is enough for you to do a highlight on something that's yeah. smaller. As uh, I base think. Code or, Scrape back some mold lines. I think that yeah. twenty. I think that twenty minutes of dedication is really good too for when you aren't motivated and there's say some areas you're not really enjoying painting. Chipping away at it will get you past that point to the point where you can enjoy that model again. So I, I always have this super basic mentality behind it. Any painting you do today is not painting you have to do tomorrow. And there's a high chance that the 20 minutes will turn into more because once, for me personally, I feel that once I get into it, I can do it more. Yeah. It's that it's that getting myself to that stage of doing it. But once you do it, because you get further and further and you're further, and yep. you're like, this you is, start this seeing is great. It come yeah. together, and, and you're like, like yeah. this is cool. Yep. This is real cool. Anything that you wish you knew when you, from when you started to now, oh, this is more like a knowledge thing, right? So obviously, 
we've been doing the hobby. I've been doing the hobby for a bit now. And this is just stuff that I wish I knew when I got in the hobby because it would have made made my hobby far more enjoyable from the from the get go. Yeah, so we're at the painting stage now. Is that where we paint? Doing? It could be building. Is there stuff that you and oh. it's probably it's probably on the list. You can talk about building if you want, because the thing we were talking about before was the clippers and the cleaning up and getting your model uh, your model ready to prime as well. So it was one thing that you were spe- speaking about earlier off 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 the podcast. I don't know. That could have been the, the overgluing been. of stuff. Oh, totally. Yeah, the overgluing. I completely forgot about that. Actually, yeah. So that's that's it's more a technique type of thing, and you can get like UV glues. I think that's set, but we're talking more about assembling larger models or vehicles or something where two panels meet. Yeah. And they're meant to be one panel. So overgluing is a technique I like to use. Getting the plastic glue, and you essentially put a bit too much glue there. Not like way too much a bit too much glue you press them together really really hard basically spills out over the top and like forms like almost the weld yeah it looks like a weld and then you let it sit for 24 hours this is again the patience type of thing and you can shave it back and sand it and then all of a sudden you've got this nice flat surface where it's meant to be it's it's more so trying to achieve that box art when you see on the box because there are quite a few vehicles where panels join and there's just a line down it and sometimes you still get those lines i still get them occasionally but yeah, I even had it with one of my Warlock models where it was like a little bit, a little bit too obvious where the the two components met, and yep. yeah, I just did exactly what you said and just used an excessive amount of glue, <laughs> yeah, and that just spills out the side, and then you can just shave it back to a nice smooth join, and it's invisible from that point on. Yeah, and if if you don't put enough glue there for that, for the over gluing, you can just get your glue, and if you run it down the line, it'll do the same sort of thing. You obviously just need to be able to control that glue pretty well because if you don't, then you could end up stuffing a model up. Yeah, totally. By adding too much glue. Yeah, definitely. And then I, I know this is still in the build stage, but I, I think it's not. It's definitely not like exclude like essential or anything like that. But I like I like the drilling out of the gun barrels. Yeah, I think that adds another level of realism to the model as well. Like yeah, seeing a model with a just sheer face. On the on the gun barrel is just looks a bit weird. Looks weird to me. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Yeah, to my brain. <laughs> so as soon as you start drilling it out a little bit, that sort of adds that extra le- level of realism. I think. Yeah, and um, you can use that drill to to magnetize your models too, if you want. That same vice pin drill. What is it? Called? Yeah, it pin vice drill. Pin vice drill. Yeah. 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 Your one was a Games Workshop one, was it not? Mine's an old Games Workshop one, and then yeah. it doesn't hold the three mil bit. So when you see the tutorial. I've got like a little bit of masking tape wrapped around a three mil drill bit and I'm hand hand drilling it out. Yeah, safety first. 100%. That masking tape. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's safe masking tape, eh? Hey? <laughs> yeah, so that was, those are probably my two that I can think of right off the top of my head with uh, starting in the hobby. But what else you got? So Mark was chatting about this earlier. His wisdom of knowledge over here. It was having an actual hobby area set up because if you don't have a hobby area set up, then it can take like 10 to 15 minutes to set up, right? So if you're one of those people that don't have a lot of time and you need to set up a hobby area and say you've only got half an hour, so you set up for 15 minutes and you paint for like five and then you have to pack it up again. And I know that ends up being more than half an hour. It's like 35 minutes. But if you've got either a setup that you can pull out of uh, a cupboard or something that's already pre-set up. You just pull it out and you can sit it on a desk and then you can just put it away. Definitely makes things easier because then you get more paint time and it's easier. It'll motivate you more. Or if you do have the room like me, I'm lucky enough to have the room. You just set up an actual hobby area so you can just jump straight into your painting and stuff because yeah, people, people, people can be time poor. I even understand like that. you're saying with the small, uh, being able to pull it out, even if you know that you're doing certain models and there's certain colors and stuff you want to, that you need to use. Yeah. Just when you get the time, just change those over. So then, when you want to get to the stage of where you want a hobby, you can pull those colors out and it's ready to go. Yeah. When don't need all your it, stuff. Yeah, you don't need all of it. So yeah. When you know, okay, I finished painting this model. I'm going to need this color scheme for these models. Put those in that thing that you got ready. Pull it out. You're good to go. And it's going to save a lot of time. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, and like you don't you don't need a massive amount of space. Like I've got one of those little cut mats at the end of one of my computer desks, 
and that area is like my hobby to go zone and you can just slide that across yeah. slide the laptop out of the way slide the the cut mat across and then the hobby area is like good to go the lamps are tucked in the corner there as well yeah i've, I've now what i've done is i've got because i've got a small computer desk in my room but i've bought a smaller keypad so what i can do is actually flip the keyboard up under my monitor the lamp's already there and I've now got a little container like you were saying just with the paints that I need and yep. the tools that I need. I sit that on my desk and I'm ready to go. So, Whereas before I didn't have that. So like you were saying, I did hit that stage where it was just like i got to set up my hobby area. and It can just be a hassle. Yeah, and it, was, it. it was more of a hassle. So it's like oh, I can just lie in bed and watch something. But then now doing that, it's made a big difference for me. Yeah. I did have one more thing that I wish I knew before I started the hobby yeah. and I actually had a big... I had a big number one written next to it. So I was meant to start with this one, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll finish with it. This is more so if you're looking to up your painting game, this is building and sub assemblies. Uh, yes, absolutely. So often probably one of the most frequently asked questions behind what brush you're using is do, do you often build, do you, do you paint them before you build them? Well, no, I, I build them in sub assemblies. They're just like, in the largest areas possible that I'll be able to glue and you won't be able to pick up where the joint is. And I also get asked when you finish painting them, how do you assemble them? Does the glue hold to the paint? I simply just use my scalpel very, very carefully and shave back the contact areas and just use plastic glue and put them back together. You can put blue tack over those areas when you're doing the sub assemblies, but I find it a pain taking the painted blue tack off. So personally, I just very, very carefully shave the areas. You don't even need to shave the whole area. Plastic glue is so strong that when it bonds, it's very tough to, to break off. So painting in sub-assemblies will level up your painting immensely because you can just reach all the areas of your models. And sometimes the push fit models that you get, like I finished the Chaplin from Indomitus recently and it was basically all together except for the head and the backpack. Because it was a push fit model, so it squeezed all together. And I had access to every single area of it. But the push fit models can be really good for sub assemblies. They're already built in a sub assembly for you. Yep. And you can pull it apart again if you want. So I find they're really good for people that are new to the hobby and they're wanting to game as well with their painted models. Painting in sub assemblies is tough because you generally struggle to game with them because they're in just like six bits yep. but the push fit stuff you can just squeeze it back together put it on the base play with it and then when you want to paint again you pull can it pull apart. it apart if you need to quite often the push fit ones you can reach all the areas as well so i think that's that's a big one sub assemblies for painting if you're wanting to get better at your painting yeah definitely definitely one for the the painter yeah more than the gamer type of thing like yep. yeah it's really hard like you said to to try and game with any models that you're in the middle of sub assembly, pretty much none. Yeah, Not if, if you're a gamer first and foremost, and you just want to do like the battle ready stuff, then you're probably going to assemble your models. But if you're wanting to like up your game, sub assemble, then game with them later. Yeah, you'll get to a point where you can game with the sub assembled stuff because you might finish a backpack and then you can glue the backpack to the model. You might finish the head and then it'll just be the arms that you need to attach. That's what you're saying, but with those clip ones that you can clip together, you can sort of see what areas that yeah. you need to access. So even if you do kind of want to get to that stage, you can paint the areas that are going to be hidden and yep. then you can glue them together and then paint the rest of it kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, so for those listening, listening, like what what would be a typical sub-assembly set up for a Space Marine? You'd have what? the, the my, t- my typical sub-assembly? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's definitely. So my typical sub-assembly will be the body and the legs assembled together. Some so the torso, the, the torso, the torso, and yeah, the torso yeah, and the yeah. legs together. Sometimes if they've got a um, real dynamic pose and they're like the knees and the legs, um, or both knees meet together, I might just blue tack one of the legs on because they join at the under armored area most of the time. Games Workshop are really good with their with how the models are built now. Most of the time, you can paint in sub assemblies and and then put it together, and you you barely even know where the joins are except for like organic models like tyranids but they're still getting better with those as well where the joins are on those models so a space marine will be the legs and the torso together i'll have the head separate the backpack and then the arms will be separate depending on the model if it's a salt intercessor the pistol and the arm will be completely separate the chainsaw arm will be completely separate 
And if it's a bolt rifle guy and he's holding both his arms together with the rifle, for those that can see me doing it on the YouTube, <laughs> he's like he's like that. Um, I'll put them together. I'll actually glue both arms together so you just squeeze it onto the model. Yeah, so then the, the shoulder sockets just like fit. Yeah, over, you don't even need to glue the torso, it. Yeah. You don't even need to glue it. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's a good good explanation. I think that'll do for what wish we knew. There's yep. probably a heap more. People could probably write in the comments section yeah. uh, stuff they, they wished they knew before they started the hobby. Definitely. Yeah. If, you're, if you're listening to this and you've got some more tips for us, chuck them in the comments section. We might do a part two. Yeah, we'd love to revisit this and just put more information out there for those starting starting next week. Yeah, a month from now, a year from now, ten years from it now. It could be a veteran that doesn't know some stuff as well. It's not just beginners. Like there's people who've been in the hobby for a long time that are just like, "Hang on, wait, you do what's what? Blue, what's Blue Tack? Yeah. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So may, maybe put some stuff in there too. If if you're in the chat, put some equipment down that you think would be good as well. We did have like a, a, that, a short you never list. Know, they might throw out something that we've never heard of that could help as well. Like yeah, more maybe me and. Yeah, yeah. Background no, mic. I think, oh, there's definitely, there's got to be some awesome ideas out there with the amount of people that are involved in the hobby today. Yeah, like. absolutely. Cool. So before we go, I think it'd be good for us to just maybe touch on where we're at right now with our hobby or like close to the hobby. So you're prepping for ARC. Absolutely. Yeah, so I that's, that's something new that I I learned today. That's exciting. Yeah, I, I, I've so I've been putting my models together. It's the painting side of it that I've recently got back into. So as we've touched on today, it's that dedicating some time. So my goal now is to dedicate at least, I'll say half an hour to start off with a night because I don't, I don't want to over. Have you got a list ready for them? A semi-list. So, semi-list? Yes. How many points are you at now? Do you know? With your last, list, so, last, so time I, last time I looked, I was a uh, one thousand and five and arcs thirteen fifty. So yeah, I've for got those that... to adjust, and but I haven't also checked the points since the um, codex came out, so yeah. there might have been some adjustments to my points. Yeah. So for those that don't know, arc is one of Victoria's largest tournaments. There's thirteen fifty points. The points change depending on the year, but I think the last couple of years has been thirteen fifty. So it's going to be in April. And this will be the first solo tournament I've attended. And I think it's the first solo oh, that you'll be attending as be. well. Yep, yes. Yeah, I'm very much looking forward to it. But th this tournament's a little bit different. I might chat to another. You can touch on it if you want. What What do you think of the the ruling behind your opponents picking how difficult your list is? So you play your opponent. And then they give you a score of how hard your list is. So th the premise behind ARC has always been just to turn up and have some casual games and have a bit of fun. Yep. It's not so much meant for your competitive meta list. Okay, yep, which I like the sound of that side of it. It's, it's really more of a, a grass grassroots promoting type. It's um, good for noobs. Yeah, it's it's just it's just a ha enjoy the hobby, have those epic battles that everyone wants to have. Oh, so someone, so just say with my nids, I'll play someone and then I'll say your list is Yeah, so there's sort the of five five different is sort of five different categories. Okay. So yep. one's just like this is the perfect list. One is it was fun. There was a theme behind it. And then you start getting to the the area where it's like, um, it was a good list, but it had some hard stuff in it. And then you start getting the area probably where you don't want to get voted in ARC, which is a bit more of the competitive side. Like you just cheat. Kind of thing. It's not so much cheesing. Like there's more recently from what I've seen, I guess it's because I've been seeing a few battle reports that Lockie watches. There is an extreme competitive side of the hobby, which is fine. But this tournament is not set up for that type okay. of game. Yep. And then there's one where you don't want to get voted this this section and it's it's literally you need to see the TO to score someone that that for that list. And I, I don't think, think I think that's a separate category. I think that's the sports. No, no, there's category. sports. Oh, is it, is it the sportsmanship? And then also with the, list and then there's build. your list. Oh, wow. But I feel like they're going to go a little bit hand in hand. Let's just say you're not a nice dude playing your game. A lot of the time you'll get voted low on your sports score. And I think people will just naturally be like, Oh, their list was, so if you just their list was, their list was pretty crummy as well, because I, I, I don't know who would be a bad sport that brings it. A bad list? That'd be a bit weird. 
But oh, yeah. so they judge you on how you are as a person as well to play. Yeah, from, school, from, yeah. The, from the sportsmanship side of things. Yeah, it's it's all peer voted. So uh, each battle, each each um, game you play, you get a, a score from from your opponent, and it's it's really cool in the sense that yeah, they they value sportsmanship and they value uh, like I guess balanced games, fair games, or it's not so much fair. It's not so much fair. It's no. more no. Fair is the wrong word. It's like, it's meant yeah. It's more enjoyable. You're meant to be able to play a full five turns. That's the idea and behind have fun with it. Not just be like oh, great, I'm versed in this list again or something like that. Well, see, uh, th- this is this is where it, like the rules are set in place before yeah. the tournament starts. You can get a fix for competitive games at a heap of other tournaments if you want to come and just. I think the idea is to have a couple of drinks and just hang out with some people you haven't seen in a long time or people you haven't met before, just have a really fun game. Do you have like to a show thematic your list game. to like judges or anything before you go? So you used to have to sure. do it. Oh, okay. So you need to you need to submit your list yep. just to make sure it's legal. But previously the judges used to score the strength of your list, but not anymore. Now it's your opponent. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Just so you know. Just That's maybe we'll, maybe we'll have a chat about this off podcast. Yeah, that might be worth it because I did not know any of that. So not, you're, you're, I'm not that I'm worried because like I said, I'm playing all kinds of models. I, I love just even the simple gargoyles. I like some of their rules. Yeah. And they just, yeah, I don't think I've got to worry about that, but I didn't know that. So yeah. good to know. So you're you're on the train to paint your army. That's that's where you're currently that's, at. Yeah, that's my goal. Yep. Cool. Nice. Where where are you at with your hobby, Mike? It's probably not a lot of hobby, but where are you at with other stuff, BFG related maybe? Yeah, so with my hobby, I'm still just focused on the Orlock gang. So I'm I'm not on the Arc train as yet. I think. Maybe 2025. Is that is that how big a gap there is between? Well, Arc Arc 2024. Is oh my god, it's, it's nearly. We're talking about 2024, aren't we? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, so yeah, 2025 maybe that'd be cool. See some Admech roll up in there. But uh, yeah, as 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 of right now, just focused on the Necromunda and. I'll, I'll enjoy watching you. I'll definitely turn up to Ark, but I'll be watching you guys battle it out for sure. Yeah. That'll be exciting. Uh, and then as far as the, the background stuff. Background yeah, mic stuff. Background mic stuff, BFG stuff. Uh, yeah, it'd be putting this putting this podcast out and then uh, the website should hopefully drop next week, which is exciting as well. Well, we might, even, we, we might even tie it in with the, with the release of the next podcast. Merch, merch, merch. Yeah. Do you definitely. mean episode three? Yeah. Yeah. Episode three. So right. We'll have we'll have another special guest, hopefully. I will go I've got I've got people lined up. Beautiful. Yeah. It just it's just a matter of who and then I'll try and line up the topic of the podcast with the person and we have on. Then they'll have to try and knock Mark off as our best guest so far. Which hey, people might not want gonna people <laughs> might <laughs> <gonna happen> people <laughs> might we'll, we'll see. We'll see in the comments section. If people want the dice daddy back. Yeah, you know? that's right. Let us know. Yeah. Let us know you want dice daddy back. It might turn from a fortnightly thing to a weekly thing. That's Who knows? Right. Yeah. That's right. We might, I'm we, not sure what we'll talk about. Well we got more room on the couch. I don't know how the camera angle hey, is I'm happy go. to I am even happy to come chill sometimes. <laughs> if people want dice study just in the background with other guests, he'll come and chill out with everyone. Just careful on using that background with Tim. That that spot's kinda of taken. Oh, just, yeah, yeah. Well, okay, yeah, well, my bad. All right. I'll be the dice trace yeah. next to Judd. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, so that's uh that's exciting. That's very soon, hopefully. Definitely. Awesome. And yourself, mate? Something's vibrating. I don't know what it is. Hopefully people can't hear that on the podcast. That's all right. It's quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so as of October 14th, my list for ARC, which I'm working on, is all but done except for some war gear changes. So I've just got a couple of different weapon loadouts I want to put on my guys. And then painted-wise, it is 100% achieved. And there is there is like seven to eight months left until arc 2024 which is what i wanted i I thought it was going to be january february and i wanted to be ready with some time for that which i I still think i would have met but uh after that i've got the display board and then it's going to be full steam into tutorials that's got to be that's got to be very exciting just sitting there knowing you've got enough models to yeah the full enough, 1350 yeah full 1350 painted and ready for arc yeah wait when you say display board you meant to have a display board for arc as well you don't need to you okay, score an cool. extra four points <laughs> <laughs> i was like there's a lot being thrown on me you right score now. you score an extra <laughs> four points okay yeah so if you're looking to score high in the paint score like I've made it no secret that I want to go and try and win best painted. Yeah. Although 
having chatted to my mate Ray and his Ulthway, <laughs> there's a very real chance that um, Ray will score very highly because his uh, yeah. his stuff is his stuff is fantastic. But I've just got the display board to do after those war gear changes. I've probably got maybe another week left painting that type of stuff, and then I don't need to rush into the display board. So I'll work on tutorials. And then the live streams will probably still be Blood Angel stuff. Work on the tutorials off stream. I'm excited about the new Blood Angels. Not, not to cut you off or anything. So nah, because the Space in, Marines have obviously just had the new release of the Codex. Yeah. Am I wrong? Yep. Um, does that mean that there's a minimal chance of that War Gear changing again for you before Ark? Or there's uh, still a chance? So War Gear, that, War Gear in, in 10th edition doesn't yeah. cost anything. Okay. Yeah. The only thing that could change is if there's a points update, which I think they're doing every six months. So there may be a points change in the future, but not the war gear itself. And the, but it wouldn't be enough that you would have to modify your list. Maybe. Who knows? Okay. If yeah. if anything, it would. Uh, I don't need to. If if it if it all goes up, then I need just need to drop some stuff. Yeah. So there's no issue there. And if it goes down, I don't think it'll be enough. The list wise, I don't think it'd be enough for me about to fit new stuff in oh, okay. anyway, yep. Yep. because it's it like I said, it dropped so not to affect you in a major sort of way. No, it, it's dropped forty points recently, so that allows for some enhancements. Yep. A apart from that, yeah, I'll be doing tutorials and, and Blood Angels live on stream. Excited for the new stuff. The new stuff's really really cool. I want great. some I want some assault terminators, but that'll be future 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 project. Yeah. Nice one. Very so, nice. yeah, I think that pretty much covers everything. Wraps it up. That does wrap it up. That brings us to the end of our second podcast. Thank you very much, Mark, for joining us. No, thanks for having me, guys, and congratulations. It's been, it's been an awesome second. time chatting to you. And, uh, yeah, stay tuned for episode three. Thank you for everyone that tuned in live on YouTube and everyone listening across the streaming services. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. We'll see you next time.